what he looked like. I tell John every so often, I call him and I say, John, this is your brother James. Are we still the sons of thunder? And <laughs> <laughs> we are, yeah. We're the sons of Lord, what a privilege it is to have men like John. Lord, I love that, that verse that says there was a man sent from God. His name was John. And Lord, we have a man sent from God. whose name is John. Lord, he has been a blessing to us in so many ways. I remember that time years ago. 20 years ago. 25 years ago. When a man came up to me and said the conference at Glen Airy was worth just coming here in the price just to hear John Crawford preach. To know that a man at his age could still be walking with God. And Lord, John has been a model for all of us. To continue to be faithful. And that we thank you for the clarity of his mind and his heart. Thank you for the great wife you've given him who supports him. And is praying for him right now at this hour. So we pray for John that you'll give him strength and that it will not be he speaking but the spirit of his father speaking through him. And then Lord give us the heart to hear. The ears to hear and the heart to obey. In Jesus name. Amen. <laughs> Now, when you phone Glen Airy, they'll say, we don't know anything about that conference. 
Then Dawes decided to move the office from downtown Los Angeles, the old Willard Hotel building, out to the suburb of Eagle Rock, up there in Pasadena, South Pasadena, out that way. Bought a warehouse. Wanted me to take three or four of the other fellas and, and refurbish it, which was our did. And after we got that done, uh, we were having conferences up at Hume Lake, California. That's 70 miles due east of Fresno. And he wanted me to build a lodge up there. So I, I did. Uh, by the way, it was 23, J or 23 percent, 23 percent grade. You know, imagine that. <laughs> and uh, uh, so we we were building on that lodge, and he come up one day and. Johnny's working with a man mighty hard, mighty hard. He said, I want you to sit down and get some popcorn and some, and some apple cider. And break out the guitars. Am I doing something wrong? Well, somebody needs to ask me to ask Peter Fulton, uh, a, a fireplace and, and, and chimney. 
Mr. Funk was a businessman in Beauty, California, and he was a board of directors, real godly man. And I didn't answer back, but I thought, snow's going to come. We don't have this house housed in. In the high Sierra, snow can come as late as early as late September, or definitely on the But I took a couple of fellows over there and, and built the chimney, and I'd break off a couple of times a day, and I'd check on them in. It took about a week to build that chimney. We came back, and you know, fellas, snow didn't come to well into November of that year. <laughs> Everything was quite all right. You see, I missed another one. 13, 17 in Hebrews. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. As they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Later on that year, that fall actually, I went down to, uh, to Reedy and having some time with Pete and his lovely wife Martha, and they wanted me to pay for a couple of rooms. <clears throat> which I did. I was sitting there in the kitchenette having a cup of coffee with Martha. She was a very serious woman, godly woman. She said, you know, John, Peter has given thousands of dollars to the Lord's work. He's given thousands of dollars to the navigator's work. And you fellows are the only fellows that's ever done anything for Peter. My heart rejoiced. You see, I didn't understand that. I didn't understand what Doss was building. He wasn't just building a lodge. He was building, building men and recruiting men and recruiting women. It's uh, a lesson. By the way, the topic of this is lessons learned from Doss. Now, Doss Trotman was the founder of the Navigators to some of you younger chaps. Uh, he founded the Navigators a few, few years before that. <clears throat> and I being a handyman and gifted with my hands and stuff, I became his, his right-hand man. Not spiritually, but practically. And uh, you see, the king's man gets more time with the king than the queen does. Because the king's man is battling the horse and polishing the boots and, and doing the chores. And the queen has her own entourage. And so I got a lot of time with Doss. And I didn't realize it in those days. I thought I was just doing chores. <coughs> See? But I was, I, was being, I was being trained. As I had the ministry in, in Long Beach I, and, and up in San Francisco as well, I was a single man at the time, I'd catch the train down and have time with Doss. And I'd spend a night and I'd get up early in the morning and go down and help Milo with breakfast. Uh, they had a, several uh, secretaries living with them and a couple of guys. One morning I came down and she said, John, would you, uh, would you mind taking some coffee out and, and pour Doss and Bill some coffee? They're having the man-to-man -man time out on the patio. I had built Doss a patio out back out of field rock and build him a barbecue pit in the middle. And in those days, you could have a fire in downtown Los Angeles. This was about 49. <laughs> and I brought the coffee out, and, and Don said, John, pour yourself a cup of coffee and have prayer with us. Uh, Bill and I were through with our time. He said, by the way, John, he said, Bill has disciples, seven or eight fellows and girls, over at... Uh, uh, Hollywood Press, and he has a burden on his heart to start a work among university people and college people, and we're going to give him man for man and girl for girl for his work to get him started. And so we had a cup of coffee and prayer. And that was the first time I had met Bill Bright, later Dr. Bill Bright. And the campus, uh, 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 the campus crusade, that is, was started by some eight navigators, some eight kids, the building disciples.
they paired up, and we gave Bill our best fellas and our best girls. You know, men, and some of you fellas in leadership, I don't think it ever entered Rawson's mind. <coughs> this young man would make a good CEO for the navigators. That's what he'd make. I think I'll try to recruit him for my work. It never entered his mind. His thought was, how can I help build Philippians 2, 3, and 4? Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. That's the verse in the Bible. <laughs> Looking on the things of others. And some of you fellows who are really underway and, and really have a grip on God, and the grip on ministry. You may be tempted to build your thing. If you do, I guarantee you what's going to happen. And when you get old, you're going to say, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. And you're going to try to get somebody to go cry with you. But if you give your soul and help the other guy, God will build you. God will build you. <coughs> Look, not every man on his own thing. One of our fellows was recruited several years ago, and, and he followed the navigators around Texas and East Coast, and um, finally came back to the greater area here. And I called him and said, hey, I understand you've been, have contact with the Nav. And he said, yeah, yeah. And he said, John, I knew you were in town. This was 20 years ago. I, I wanted, to, wanted to come see you, but uh, I hadn't had time. And John, Give me a time. Let me come down and see you. I said, no, I want to see you. He said, no, John, let me come see you. I said, no, I want to see you. He said, John, it's the same distance. You remain me to you. I said, I know it is. But I insist. So I went out to see him, and I said, you got any men? He said, no. I said, you, uh, I, I, I said, where is this? I said, John, we've got not, not what it should be. I said, once you get your act together and get your time with God, get on your back verses and check out on some, get you some men to call me. About three months, he called me. Went out, met with his men, he had three, checked him on his verses, and he's been going hot ever since. Oh, year or two later, we were out bird hunting, and I, <clears throat> we stopped by Dennis for a cup of coffee and some pie, and uh, that's my reward for bird hunting. <laughs> I said, uh, Years ago, you got on the land and you had to come back with that to the folks and you were bowed down and now you're underway. What was it that got you underway? He said, John, you're the only man I've ever met that insisted you help me instead of me help you. It was my spirituality. It was my great knowledge of theology. It was my great conquest of memorizing scripture. No. I said, well, I won't mention singing. <laughs> I said, you're telling me because I put you before me, you're now on the way. He said, that's, I'm telling you exactly that. Exactly that, John. That's all there is to it. I said, well, Mike, anybody can do that, can't they? He says, of course they can. Of course they can. You see, of course they can. You may not be able to put a message together like Kirk Humphreys. You may not be able to put a business proposition together like Kirk Humphreys. You may not even be able to be mayor. But you can put the other guy before yourself. Look, not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the thing to work. Isn't that, isn't that glorious? See, I learned that. I'm, by the way, I'm talking about lessons learned from dross. Okay? Uh, dross was good friends with, uh, with uh, Jim Rayburn. Jim Rayburn started Young Life. And uh, <clears throat> Jim said, Dawes, 
I thank you for making this day, uh, developing on the West Coast, putting your office on the West Coast. I think you ought to go inland, and I, I, I won't suggest Colorado. Come over to my ranch. So we went over to, to Jim Ray Ranch and had a conference, and uh, we liked the country, and so Dawes began to look around for some property. And we located the property, I forgot what the name of it was, but where the cabin is now. We had option on to buy that, by the way. And then Glen Eyre came on the market, we gave up our option. Isn't it wonderful that we didn't buy that and start developing? Him and the domain would uh, <laughs> uh, take it over and we lost all that. So we bought, we bought Glen Eyre. And uh, uh, that's where I, I was sent with six men to, to uh, work for Mr. Strait. Mr. Strait was the owner, he's an old man from Texas. And he sold it to us at a, at a darling price, even back then, 250000 and then another 50000 for the furniture. And so when he decided to sell his property, his men started looking for work. And so they began to get jobs, and so he, he was left without labor. So Dawson said, well, I'll send you some. So he sent John and, and about six guys. So we worked for Mr. Strait there, milked the cows, and uh, looked after the horses, and mowed the lawn, and what have you. And we had dirt roads. Mr. Strait liked us those roads drove about every day or every other day, got them real smooth, pretty little garden, you know. One day I was uh, cutting weeds by the road, the sloping ditch, and I had a swing, and I was swinging like this and cutting the weeds, and Mr. Strait came by in his Cadillac, and, and fellas, there was about two dozen straws of grass on the road about two toes. And he said, John, you are going to get this grass off this road, aren't you? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Strait. So he left, and of course I got the grass off the road. I thought it was kind of funny, you know. In Colorado, in July, August, two dozen pieces of grass will wilt in about four, five, six hours, you know. <laughs> But John got it off. Well, I told Doss about that. I thought it was a funny story. We'd have a laugh. <laughs> he, he said, John, that's great. That's going to be our in the castle. The castle's got 17 bathrooms. By the way, it's been sitting there all those years and only three, three of the bathrooms leaked. Well, they located a man in his 70s, uh, a plumber, an old plumber, retired plumber, but he was an apprentice back in 04, 03, 02, when they completed the castle. And he and I were chatting out in the, in the uh, in the foyer there. And he told me uh, that he worked on there all the way through the job. And he said, I stayed on there for several months after, after the building was completed. And he said, you know, one of my jobs was, and we, he laughed, and he said, I had a, a screwdriver. And he says, in, in those days, the plumbers used leather washers, washers on spigots. And so one of my jobs was uh, going around in the bathrooms, and the word on the hot left hand is hot and cold, H-O-T and C-O-L-D. And as you would <clears throat> turn the water off, it would wear down the washer a little bit. And so, so the word uh, H-O-T and the word C-O-L-D would be at angles to the backsplash. 
And my job was to take my screwdriver and take the little cap off and adjust it and go around the bathroom every couple of days and adjust all these tickets <laughs> so that the words would read parallel to the <laughs> And we had a good laugh. <laughs> Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance when you serve the Lord Christ. During those days, we were putting in uh, manholes and septic tanks and drain fields and what have you. General Palmer had all of his, his, his services underground. He had his, like, his wire underground. And so we were working, and God's come by one day, and he said, John, everything's all dug up. It just stays dug up. <laughs> he went on, and I thought to myself, how can you put in a manhole without digging it up? <laughs> how can you put in a septic tank and drain field without digging it up? That really wasn't what he said. That's what he said, but what he meant was, John... You never cover things up. And you never get it fixed. You just leave it dug up. So I went on down to where the fellows were working in a manhole. And uh, I told them my problem. One well, of the farm boys woke up and said, John, get us some rye. Rye? Rye what? Well, you know, oats, beans, wheat, rye, you know, seed, rye. Oh, grain, yeah. Get, get some seed. I said, what are you going to do? He said, just as soon as we get through with the place, we will scatter the seed, take a finger rake, rake it in. He said, a week, week and a half, we'll have some green. <coughs> Fellas, I took care of it. Job 29, 16. I was a father to the poor, and the cause which I knew not, I searched out. You see, Problems come up. Well, it's not my fault. It's the government's fault. It didn't get your check. Or it's the boss's fault. Or boy, those lumbermen, they just don't deliver things. Or boy, these computer guys are. See? One time I was on a job and I made this mistake. I said, John, I didn't know. He said, John says it closed the library. I know. I there's so much you don't know. You know? I was a father to the poor, and the cause which I knew not, I searched out. And fellas, that has been such a blessing to me. Lessons learned from God. My eyes are bad. I don't read anymore. Well, I can't read. Boo, boo, boo. Can't read. So what do you do? I get a couple of guys to read to me. We have a good time fellowship together. They have this swing shift and they come over in the morning and, man, we just have a moment. Okay? What do you do about your Bible? I got a CD. I got a King James CD. How about that? So I get more Bible reading than I used to do when I could read. Things like that. When I my, my wife puts my breakfast on the tray and I sit in and I plug it in and I, I get 10, 15 chapters. And the older days I got one, two, three, four. See? I was a father to the poor. And the cause which I knew not, I searched out. I made it my business to find out what in the world is going on. You see? We were down in the jail and as missionaries. And it makes, and they come, they're godly fellows we're working with, but they come from a socialist background. And so they said, we don't want you foreigners raising money down here. 
we want you to raise your money back home. Well, I come from back home and Skip Gray helped me get over and raise money and all such as that. And, but I was working with young people, I was with college kids and servicemen. And lo and behold, when I got over there, they started getting married and things like that. Well, they don't have to two become one and they just have one and one going to the missionary. So our money was going down, down, down. Well, what are you going to do? Go, well, go home and raise money. Go home and raise money. If I had that kind of money, I wouldn't need to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing God taught me is, God, don't take yourself too seriously. So I tried to learn that. So I was down in the zero. Well, don't take it too seriously. Okay? Okay, don't take it too seriously. So hell and I prayed about it. Uh, Farmer was beside me, came in for Bible study, and the man to man time, and he and his wife, and they said, John, how would we like to support you? And we said, we're rolling. We're not allowed to raise money down here. He said, what verse is that? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I don't actually have a verse on that. Well, he shook his head. Next week he come, he said, you, you folks eat beef? I said, yeah, we eat beef. You got a freezer? Yeah, we got a freezer. Next time he come, he brought a half a cow. <laughs> he supported us in beef for seven years. <clears throat> you see? The cause which I knew not, I searched out. Isn't that fantastic? You know? That there, there's a solution out there. Uh, about 1982, the navigators decided to reorganize again. <laughs> and, uh, I was state director up in Oklahoma, Arkansas, way, and so they reorganized. And so uh, I was left out of the organization. I've been on the board of director for 15 years and country leader and you know all that kind of good stuff and here we left out. I went up to see Gene Warren, told him my story. I should have known, but he had such a sweet voice. <laughs> and went home. Would it affect you at all? I said, well, I need some place to receive my money. Or he said, we could get some church to do that or we could set up some. Is there anything else? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I don't get this, Gene. <laughs> and then he looked up and leaned over his desk and roared about three times as fast as about, John! Get on with what God has told you to do. So I tucked my tail between my legs. <laughs> went home. And my wife was working her sink, looking out the window. And so I come in, she's a hot end, and I said, hi, sweetheart. And so I just leaned up against the counter back over there, talking to her, her back was to me. So I told her my story with Gene and told him what he said in a tone of voice. And she said, well, she didn't look around. He probably got something really. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was the father to the poor, the cause which I knew not I so shall. Did you know that that decision was the beginning of King and Conference? I was freed up. I could do something that I wanted to do. Did you know I no longer had to make formation? I no longer had to, had to send in reports. 
I no longer had to get together with a committee, you see. And God has blessed in these last 24 years, 25, 24 years, greater than any 24 years of my life, you see. I thought I had to be tied into the organization. Now I'm still on staff, you know, but I, I, I don't run the show like I used to, see. You know, I'm, I'm telling you that for a reason, now, fellas, because I know human nature, but I know me, you see. And, and, and sometimes, sometimes because you didn't get called to this church, or sometimes because you didn't get this job, or sometimes you, you might think, well, uh, I guess they're sent in my life. It probably is, but not <laughs> Isn't it great that those people over to Galley, boy, they're sure sweet. You know, they agreed to put lunch off for one thirty. You know. <laughs> She's been 
pray. She's been praying while we've been up here. I, I appreciate you guys. I appreciate your compliments. I appreciate you saying, boy, John, good job. I, I appreciate all that. You know, we, we enjoy that. I do enjoy it. But the reason I'm up here is she's down there. That's great. Father, I want to thank you for this. Oh, God. <coughs> I commit to you. I pray, God, that you would take every one of these fellows. Oh, no one up behind. And make them into your perfect servant. Lord, you will fill them with your spirit. And I thank you for these dear folks who run this place. Lord, give them your grace. And Father, this morning we want to pray for our fellows and girls on the front line in the battlefield. Oh God, we don't want to get forget them. Oh God, they're there and so, so we can be here. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Thank you, man.